Thanks. Uh, so Steve Muse, I work for the service provider group at Kentix. So um, what we're going to talk about today is our view of embedded CDN caches in service provider networks and what we're, what's sort of happening, what's the latest and greatest. Um, this presentation was sort of born by my colleague, Nina Bergeson, who many of you probably know. Nina, back in probably 2012, was working for uh, a Danish telephone company, TDC, and was getting sort of flooded by requests from all the various cache providers at the time to uh, install these caches embedded in her network. And she, she was sort of frustrated by the various inconsistencies between um, all the different vendors. So she sort of convened a panel at a, a NANARG or a RIPE or an EPF or something like that and sort of tried to say like, you know, are there ways that we can kind of, uh, you know, make this a little bit more consistent for the operators? Uh, so this is my first time back in Australia from since 2000 Adelaide ITF. So it's been it's been quite a long run, but I'm glad to be back here. And uh, as I was putting these slides together, um, the program committee had asked me to see if I could add some information about you know specifically the Australian market. And I kind of had a flashback to 1999 when I realized I had worked on another caching project here in Australia, uh, so slightly different type of caching project. So in the, in the early days, in 99, I was working for a company called, well, at one point it was BBN, and then it became GTE, and then it became Genuity, but we were Internet AS1, if you remember the, that network. Um, and we had a, a number of multinational corporations uh, that wanted us to be able to provide services all over the globe. Uh, and it was long enough ago that Digital Equipment Corporation was one of those customers. So. Um, that, that's a name from a bygone era at this point. So we built a pop in Sydney. We had a, a bunch of ASNs, so we used AS201 for our Sydney pop. And uh, we connected the pop two by E1, I think it was, um, for that particular trans-Pacific provider was using E1s. And we realized, you know, at such immense expense for those two by E1s, we decided that, you know, we would be smart and put our engineering hats on and tried to do some uh, you know, early forms of transparent caching. So we embarked on a project to do that. And so I happened to dig through a box of old photographs and I apologize for the really blurry ancient 35 millimeter photo, but this was the state of the art in transparent web caching in 1999. So some of these old names, of course, uh, the sun boxes where it ran, one of them ran squid, one of them ran ink to me, and I don't remember that name, Ink to Me, eventually ended up getting gobbled up by Yahoo and helped build their uh, infrastructure eventually. But uh, a few other boxes here that are kind of nameless. And I had a conversation with Lincoln the other day about the yellow box, and he actually remembered the name of the provider. I don't know if Lincoln's in the audience and could yell out the name. Anyone recognize that yellow box? It was like cash flow? Cash flow, yeah, that's what it was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We, we say of, of the similar vintage, that's, that's, that's the right way to say it, right? But, you know, just to give you some, uh, some, some uh, you know, idea, you know, we're talking one by 100 interfaces off of a Cisco 7509, I think it was, VIP 240s probably with PAFEs. Um, I also had a conversation with Lincoln about, um, my memory was that it was running a predecessor to WCCP, but he, he, he convinced me that it was actually just a very early undocumented WCCP. I went back looking for the, the internet drafts and it was much later, so yeah. I'll, I'll take his word for it since he probably wrote the code. 9600 baud, out of band modem, 10 megabit, half duplex management interfaces, so that's kind of the era. So the whole idea was like, you know, let's try to save some money on this and, and try to conserve bandwidth. And uh, did it work? Anyone guess? No. Because most Australians are smarter than us, and we're already caching. <laughs> so we had this huge project to do all this caching work, and it turns out it was a giant waste of time because you are far smarter than we are, and we're already caching. But I got a free trip to Australia out of it, so I wasn't complaining too much. So fast forward now uh, to the modern era. If we kind of have a little bit of remedial conversation about what a CDN is, you know, I think everybody in this room understands it, but if you think about the three things that really defines what a CDN is, it's a collection of servers out in the world, you know, close to the edge or wherever, um, you know, geographically disperse. Um, but it's also a method to get the content 
onto those servers and then a way, some mechanism to steer that traffic to the end eyeballs. Um, so, you know, in the early days, sort of 99 time frame when we were working on that, ca you know, transparent caching project, it was really kind of early days for Akamai. So Akamai was still kind of the only, what we consider now to be a traditional CDN. There might have been a few others, but Akamai was sort of the main game. Um, and there were, you know, various forms um, uh, of services that were provided back then. The growth in that period of time between, you know, from 99 to 2012, it was, you know, obviously straight content, but, you know, from the 2012 era to now, the main growth for that, uh, the driver for that was OTT services, right? So we started seeing streaming video becoming a thing in those last, you know, 15 years, I guess now. Um, so traditional players like Akamai, Lumen, Tata, Egeo, and so forth, all maybe had different names at some point in time. Uh, they all had fairly global reach, well-established names, and so forth. Um, the largest content providers would, you know, play them off of each other, so they would have, you know, their content placed uh, amongst a uh, spread of these different CDNs for arbitrage. But also, you know, the various CDNs had different services that might work better for larger files versus smaller files or whatever, so they could uh, they could diversify across CDNs using, um, you know, based on whatever services they need at the particular time. But what ended up happening, and as you all know, these, the, the mega content providers obviously ran out of the ability to <laughs> use these smaller edge CDNs and they realized that the economy of scale was was right to start building their own CDNs. So that's where we start to see like Netflix, Apple, Microsoft, you know, Amazon, Facebook, Google, all build their own giant, massive global networks over that period of time, and start, um, you know, consolidating onto their own networks and so forth. You get to a certain point in time where you have the economy of scale; it actually becomes cheaper and more efficient, and you can control the steering of the traffic a lot more in your favor in that particular way. But it's interesting, though, that the last comment here is. Is, is a notable change in the CDN market where the large providers like AWS, uh, you know, Google with GCP, um, you know, the, the cloud compute providers also have CDNs, like AWS has CloudFront and so forth. But now the traditional CDNs are starting to do the reverse, starting to build in compute. So, you know, Akamai recently purchased Linode, Stackpath is doing edge compute, and even new entrants into the market like Quilt are offering um, edge compute services as well. So it, we're kind of doing this interesting uh, dance around each other, uh, and services are starting to look a lot more common. Still a long way to go, but they're, they're starting to look more common across the, uh, the marketplace. So with regards to specifically caches that can be embedded within service provider mark, you know, service provider networks, these are kind of the main players. Um, we'll talk about the distribution of these, but uh, this is kind of from our perspective, what we're seeing our customers uh, actually see. And there are some newer players to this entrance, you know, the, the top, you know, Akamai, Netflix, Google, Facebook, um, those were obviously sort of the um, the, the legacy, not, I wouldn't say legacy, but the one, the, the networks that have had embedded caches for the longest, so you, you see those most common places. But companies like CDN77 and Quilt are starting to show up a lot more, and, 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 in, and we'll talk about some localization that uh, shows up more interesting in a little bit. So as we kind of dig into the data a little bit, and I wish I could, wish I had better eyes here, um, we kind of stumbled across a study that was done by Lefteris, uh, who is now at Cisco, um, but a paper that was released in 21, and they, they, the result was that they measured uh, roughly 3,500 different ASNs that had embedded caches with them. And that was kind of very eye-opening to us, first because they could become potential customers for us, but it was really interesting to see that it, they were really that wide uh, dispersed. Um, and if we we started at that point looking into our own customer data to try to see, 
you know, what was the spread? What was, wh what different um, type of embedded vendors we were providing? And then we came up with this, this is the top, uh, top six list here. Uh, again, names that you would expect to see, um, but, um, but they're starting to see some change. Now, it's really interesting. We were looking at this from a global perspective, but as we kind of started to zoom closer into individual markets, Latin America really kind of stuck out like a sore thumb to us because all of a sudden we realized that the Latin American customers that we have really ended up with a quite a larger number of embedded cash vendors. And so, you know, if the average in America or North America or Europe or somewhere else was maybe four to five, you know, Latin America was more like eight or nine, which was kind of interesting. And so we haven't quite exactly figured out why. You know, we were trying to figure out is it higher cost to deliver bits uh, to, to the South America? So, you know, is that going to drive up the need to have more embedded cash? Um, logistics for getting, you know, equipment in and out is harder. Um, you know, just uh, the other one that we, we, we did kind of talk to some customers about was they have fewer legacy video services. So they're, no, they're not offering their IPTV services. So the, their customers are a lot more dependent on other type of OTT services that would typically be served off of these embedded caches. So for this particular presentation, I took a close look at the ANZ region and I was kind of disappointed. <laughs> it looked pretty much tr like the traditional. Now, granted, we don't have the largest customer base in, in Australia, but you know, um, it, it was pretty much the average was the four big players was were what we were seeing. You know, a few few smaller things like um, the gaming company uh, Valve, but that's I'm not even sure we really consider that to be a, a true embedded cache it's sort of like application caching. And so again. Looking at the reasons why, you know, I think probably it comes down to cost. You know, there's a, a rich enough interconnect capability here in this continent that it's, it's probably less about economics. It's easier to get peering from the other content providers. There's enough transport to, to move it around. So population density maybe, you know. So I'm curious to get feedback on that. If, if you think this is a number is too low or if we're missing data here, that'd be kind of curious. So I'll be, a, I'll be around afterwards. We can chat if you want. So this is kind of interesting. We started to dig into what the traffic looked like from these embedded caches. And um, this particular sample we're looking at was over, uh, a, a, I think it was a week, a 24 hour period, but it included Sunday night. So we could see the, the, the Sunday night peak that we, we normally see. So, uh, you know, this is not specifically from the embedded cache, but this is for, from the customer network in general. So 74% of the traffic is still coming in over the network border, 14% uh, being delivered directly from the embedded caches into the eyeballs, um, and, and then the rest is sort of like, you know, and ex, you know, caches feeding each other and embedded to embedded, you know, embedded to internal traffic for management and things like that. What, what's more interesting to me is this chart. This kind of chart shows the breakout between uh, the, the four largest players that we see. And it, it's kind of interesting to talk through some of, um, some of the statistics here. But basically, you know, we can see like the blue, the blue chart here being uh, outside to end users. So how much is being delivered off net? Uh, embedded to end users would be the, the reddish orange there chart. So how much, it's just in kind of showing cash efficiency. So Google, um, Google and Facebook tend to quite often look very similar because they're serving similar-ish kind of content. Netflix is, is interesting because obviously Netflix, uh, as they get better and better about um, getting more density in their cache um, devices, they can get closer and closer to serving an enti their entire library off of uh, you know, their, their, a, a cluster embedded in a customer's network. So they have a much higher efficiency of serving eyeballs off of those boxes. Now Akamai, there's a little bit of a, a, a data inconsistency here. They have a much, uh, from our perspective, they have a much more dynamic set of content. Um, so they're, they're, they're serving uh, you know, con different content constantly from different, different caches. At the time that we took this particular measurement from the 
customers that allow us to share this anonymized data, they, some of the customers' caches were at full capacity and were way behind in getting their upgrades completed. This is still during, towards the end of COVID, so there were still, uh, you, know, you know, supply chain issues. So the, the Akamai data is not as drastic in reality as it looks on this particular chart, but we wanted to keep it uh, as we saw it, so. But like I said, <clears throat> they tend to be a little bit more dynamic in terms of the type of content that they serve. So some of the mechanics, um, I'll, I'll probably go through this fairly quickly because this is kind of like remedial uh, CDN uh, <laughs> information that you fairly probably all know here, but there's multiple mechanics on the steering side of it to get the, the traffic to the eyeballs. You know, BGP off course is, is used in that. Um, sometimes providers can be peering directly with the cache networks, um, directly with the cache routers necessarily, but um, to, to provide which regional networks get served by those caches. But there's obviously other mechanisms as well. DNS, of course, is a huge mechanism. You know, using client subnet zero or, you know, the origin resolver information to be able to steer that traffic to the eyeball. Um, and the cast is most commonly used in terms of the distribution there. Geolocation comes into as well, some, some providers. And, the, and the, the interesting thing in the perspective that Nina had when she originally wrote this presentation was that there's very little consistency. So from a networker, network operator's point of view, it was very frustrating because everybody has their own special sauce and, and everything's a, a little bit of a snowflake compared to each other. So from a, an operator's perspective, it can be kind of kind of tricky to kind of operate this. So this is, uh, you know, just a quick chart on what it looks like in terms of, you know, BGP, you know, you're basically, what this is coming down to say is that you can feed prefixes into the, the edge router, or the cache router set if, if that particular provider is doing that. You have to be careful in terms of your prefix allocation. There have been issues where Providers have not been very good about allocating prefixes correctly across their, you know, say, national network. And if you don't have good regionalization, that can cause issues in terms of providing the right set of prefixes to the regional caches and things like that. So steering can become a problem there. Uh, and this is just basically showing, you know, what it looks like uh, for DNS steering. And, and I'll, I'll provide these slides later if anyone wants. I don't know if they're going to be posted online anywhere. Okay, so uh, I won't go into this, but it's basically showing how uh, DNS can move that traffic around as well, which I'm sure you're all familiar with anyways. And then, you know, again, there's other magic that goes into it as well. Uh, you know, each, each one of these networks has additional metadata that they pull. You know, latency and other QoS data plays into it, of course. Um, some can pull the uh, QoE information off of set-top devices and use that to help steer uh, load of the server, you know, the cluster. Um, and, and load of the cluster can come into play too because not cl all clusters are built equally. Some have lots of compute and not as much disk. Um, so traffic can get moved around during peak period of time depending on, you know, the capacity of those in, in each individual clusters and so forth. And then not all content is on all servers and all CDNs, right? So some CDNs, they'll, they'll move things around um, dynamically so you can end up seeing a lot of cache fill or, or mid-tier caching, I should say. Now, this is, this is kind of the, some of the fun stuff is to actually look at this and, and, and take a look at what it looks like um, as it's actually happening over the course of a day or a week. This is what a typical Netflix um, uh, cache placement would look like. Um, the large blue uh, line there is, is well, it, says, it says on that, to, it's actually what's being served from the cache. The green line, um, let's see, on that cache, uh, I can't even read that, it's so small. But basically what you can see is their cache fill window is very, I know, I'm, 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 I'm old, I need like double glasses to read this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you're getting old when you have to have glasses and read your glasses on top of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they have a very consistent cache fill window. So they, they fill very specifically at a very late period of time, at nighttime, because they're not doing a lot of mid-tier fill. Right? So they can, they can really keep that library nice and tight and, and, and only fill at that very certain period of time. But if we then go to somebody like Akamai, you can see 
the cash fill being the green line there is a lot more and it's a lot more broad throughout the course of the day because they have such more of a, a dynamic content load and it's not always, like you said, not all content is on all caches at all times. So there's a lot more um, of that fill traffic. But it's also interesting too is that you can see a lot of cache to cache fill there as well. That's, that's consistent over the course of the day. Um, this is interesting too because then if you start to take a look at like a Facebook, um, their different type of content will dictate uh, their fill pattern. So in their particular case, um, there are things like um, not all, you know, like it says here, not all content will ever be on the embedded servers because some things need to be globally synchronized. And so like likes and thumbs ups and things like that and, you know, feeds aren't necessarily all cacheable. So you'll see a lot of the video content, a lot of the static ads and things like that being served off the caches, but smaller feed traffic will be uh, brought in from the global side of it, the cache fill side of it. And that's why you see sort of a, a, sort of a mid, mid sort of level fill. Um, is that the last one? Yeah. So uh, another mechanism that uh, Nina was, was mentioning in her original presentation was um, you need to be able to provide some restrictions on uh, who can access the server because you don't want to have you know, a server in you know, Melbourne feeding somebody in Gold Coast, things like that. Um, the common way to do this is through the use of BGP to the edge cache router, but not all clusters will do that. And um, you know, there, there, there are con considerations again around cluster sizing and things like that that can become problematic. So having an idea of how you define who can access those becomes um, you know, an issue. So when it comes to actually deploying it, the, the f what we saw you know, in 2012 timeframe when, when it first started becoming a thing regularly, was that the caches were placed sort of like, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's different in each region, but they might be placed at the peering edge level, like say, you know, so maybe a central data center in Sydney or, or Brisbane or someplace like that. But over time, as the, the size of that traffic kept growing and growing and growing, and, and of course we know it's mostly video traffic, the transport networks from that central location down to the individual edge locations started to become a real problem. Um, you know, IP less so much, but the physical, you know, getting enough bandwidth down to those edge, edge eyeballs became an issue. So the trend that we're seeing now is that, and, and for the last number of years, is that the caches are getting pushed all the way out into the metro to the BNG location or the and cable at CMTS, whatever your layer three aggregation is. So that alone can create some problems though because now you have uh, more things to manage. You have a much more distributed set of servers to, to deal with. Um, clustering becomes an issue too. So if, the, if you're pushing this all the way out to a, you know, a very small remote edge location and it doesn't have a lot of disk, then there's a lot of back and forth between edge fill and so forth like that. So um, you know, it's, it's the trend that we see is that these caches are getting pushed all the way as close to that layer three first layer three aggregation point as possible. That's the most effective in terms of bandwidth utilization, but it can cause other problems because the reality is that these layer three aggregation points are quite often not places ever meant for x86 to live. Uh, you know, I worked for a cable company in the U.S. and. <laughs> If we asked for half a rack to, of server space in, in one of those re remote aggregation sites, we would be laughed out of the building. So, But it's becoming now more and more popular, especially with edge compute uh, plays. So that's kind of state of the art in terms of what's happening in, in, in ed, uh, edge embedded caches. We kind of got this fun event uh, that uh, many people at this conference have talked about, Garab especially, the the th Amazon Prime Video Thursday Night Football. Um, streaming sports in, in the US hadn't really done particularly well. I mean, we had a, a few events here, and, uh, but Thursday Night Football on Amazon Prime ended up becoming quite a, quite a big uh, moment. 
and, and for a measurement company like Kentec, we got really excited to be able to watch this live and, uh, and see what it looked like. And so in the, in the tradition of you know, graphs that show very spiky things, you know, this was uh, the first couple of weeks of uh, a particular customer of the Amazon Prime Video. So this is filtered to just Amazon Prime Video so you can see how much of a differentiated it was for those particular nights. What's that? Five minutes, okay. That should be fine, yeah. Um, it was really interesting to see the difference in, in the, and it looked like traffic was dwindling and we couldn't figure out like, are they losing interest that quickly? And then we looked at the schedule and we realized, no, it's just the local, the local team wasn't playing on that Thursday night, so <laughs> they, they lost interest that particular time. So, um, and I apologize for the colors on these graphs. I, I, I chose very poorly to be presenting this on a huge stage. But it, this is trying to show you the differentiation between uh, the embedded cache traffic, which is the big spike, and the, uh, how much peering in transit is for each one of those. So the lighter, uh, uh, the lighter is, is through peering in transit. And if I, we can drill into that, kind of see a little bit better um, what it looked like coming off the embedded cache, how much was coming over private peering, and, and how much was coming over IX. Now this is for one particular customer, but we found that this generally held true. So Amazon was able to, Amazon Prime Video specifically, was able to get a number of these caches deployed very quickly out into the field, and a handful of our customers were lucky enough to receive them. So we were really excited to be able to dig into this and, and look to see what, how it behaved. So if we, if we drill in, to a little bit even further than that, if we look at just the external traffic coming in, um, and, and this is basically showing um, from specifically CDNs that we were able to identify what was the breakdown of that traffic. Of course, Amazon's own CDN was able to handle the vast majority of that extra load, but they still did come in through other vendors like Akamai, Edge, uh, Fastly, and Edgeo, and so forth. Now, Garab has told me my, my data is not 100% accurate, and I've invited him to give me the right mapping so he could uh, make it more accurate, but we'll see if that happens. So, you know, to wrap up, you know, the other thing, too, is that hardware, of course, has gotten more efficient over that same period of time. Um, you, can, you can put so much more density in, in the racks nowadays. I, I've been specifically keeping tabs on the Netflix team and watching their advancements on how much they can get out of you know half a rack or whatever or whatever there is it's incredible the amount of files that they uh, or how, how much traffic they can produce out of that but uh, you know the hardware just gets better and better of course but it consumes more and more power so um, is it easier now than it was then you know our conclusion is you know it's more efficient but it's you know about the same smaller boxes more traffic coming out of it more zeros on the end, but it's effectively the same. So um, things are starting to change a little bit here. You know, CGN becomes complicating factor sometimes, depending on how you deploy that. And you know, the biggest trend that we're seeing is that there are more and more players. So as more and more people are, uh, you know, creating more and more over-the-top content, um, specifically in some of these remote markets, that we're seeing a lot more embedded cash players. So what's your experience? Is, are you seeing similar, similar uh, penetration? Are you seeing new vendors that we haven't mentioned here before? We'd love to talk to you. We have a booth out there, and I'll be here for a while today. Uh, I guess any questions at that point?